Welcome back to From an Educator. In this episode, we're talking about magic. Yeah, so I'll describe more what that means in a moment. See you soon. Welcome back, everybody, to From an Educator. I'm Mr. James, an educator. And in this episode, show number 79, magic. Ooh. And not in a weird way. In a way in which I described last time of my inclusion of the magic arts, magic effects, illusions, uh, riddles, questions, things like that. Things that trick the brain or at least lead us to question uh, reality and things that we see. And that's my inclusion of that in my classroom, which I've been doing uh, and where that has come about and why I think it's really useful for us to uh, delve into this area of you know, performance or things that we see and we don't really, we're not able to describe immediately and our reaction to things like that is how that's going to help us to uh, kind of view the world and be very more critical of everything. So I hope everyone's doing okay. This has been a long time coming to try to do another episode. Uh, it's uh, currently Thursday. It is Parfait Day. But otherwise, the major holiday is in the uh, United, United States. We're celebrating the American Thanksgiving. Uh, well, some people are. Uh, the rest of us are celebrating Parfait Day because parfaits are fruit and like some sort of whip topping and then just delicious, right? Yeah. But yeah, I have a holiday show I do for children and I always mention daily holidays and there's a place online that kind of puts them all together for me and I use bitmojis and such to make it interesting. And it's always nice to just to, to find out like less celebrated holidays so people can enjoy something that they didn't expect to. So, wow, it has been a while since I've actually done a legit podcast and not just something where I turn a camera on in the car and just try to grab segments of things of me talking because it has been a mess of a school year and it continues to be a mess. Uh, the children are just reserved there somewhere else. Uh, they may be at school, but their their minds are elsewhere. I know that for some, there's probably the threat of getting sick with COVID. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of unrest in many homes. Uh, just being able to focus on things is tough for them. And what I'm I'm noticing a lot in my classroom is the fact that because I'm a unified arts teacher. Uh, teaching music, and it doesn't really matter what I teach, but it's uh, I'm a break from the classroom, and the classroom is always we've they've got a schedule, they have to do so many hours or, or time, whatever, on a certain subject, and they have to get results, and it's like turn it on, turn it off, and I know for many students it's really hard to do that, and so when they come to my classroom, I'm considered the break. And it has to be fun. And I have to balance, you know, a lot of things, uh, especially when there's a lot of students there. So what I'm trying to do, I always want to give them a chance to be individuals. But as late past few weeks, I've had to do a lot of different group projects or not really a project, sort of like a group, meaning the entire class <clears throat> activity. And I've seen, you know, what it's like when I have to keep doing these and trying to make sure everyone gets a chance at doing something. But at the same time, when a small group of someone of students is doing something and the larger group is watching how to keep them actively engaged. And I've got some definite great ideas about this and a few successes, but for the most part, I'm not getting students that can be engaged and actually learning at a, at a rate that I want them to learn. But I have to realize that, you know, it's happening everywhere. It's happening in their classroom. It's the stress of just being 
at school when we probably should be remote. We probably should have been remote months ago, but for some reason, they're just not letting us go remote. They rather just keep having many students quarantine, like up to a hundred or so, you know, as of these past past month, I think, I think at one point we had a hundred students out and many staff as well. And it's just one of these things like they're just pushing through it for some reason. I think it's kind of bullheaded, but I know they want parents to be able to work and we're kind of like the babysitters, I guess. But anyways, you know, trying to have children learn that educational pursuit is always difficult. But it's something we're going to keep pushing forward. And this is kind of why we teach, right? So anyways, that's kind of like what it's been going on for me. I have had a few little things here and there to prepare for gigs and such. And I've been... Uh, looking into magic and looking into other things that I include in my classroom and things that definitely require practicing, you know, something that I have to do often enough so it can become second nature, uh, as well as uh, a show that I'll be in very soon, which has to do with just dancing and acting, sort of like a pantomime thing. So anyways, let's get to the uh, main show. All right, magic. So you're probably seeing, if you're watching the YouTube version of this, a person uh, with a deck of cards. And honestly, uh, card magic was not what I really wanted to get into whatsoever. Uh, I've seen people, you know, use cards for gambling, cards for, you know, so many different types of games. Uh, one of the things when I taught summer school was to give each student a deck of cards and I showed them a few card tricks. And then I also had them, uh, you know, adapt several different games and they all knew different games that some of which I didn't know, or I just haven't remembered. And cards to me, is always like, it was always something where it was, wasn't really, uh, was no real illusion because I could figure that you probably could memorize the order of the cards if you really spent time doing it. Just kind of like someone memorizes the 40 something moves to solve a Rubik's cube. You could, someone could give you a Rubik's cube in any configuration. And if you were memorized the 40 something odd moves, you could know exactly what move had to go next. And there are people online that do that and they can solve one with a single hand. They can solve it in, you know, a minute uh, because they memorize everything. And I figured you could do that with cards as well. So I said, whatever, you know, if you really could have make your mind very mathematical, you probably could figure, do anything with cards. And, uh, but as of late, I've kind of gotten back a little bit into card magic and I have a few novels or texts that I'll be using to uh, better inform some things I can do with that. But it's not like I'm going to be going on the street and trying to set up shop and doing something with that at all. This is still just my exploration of learning certain techniques. And I'm going to talk about a couple of these techniques too, because I think they apply to real life and things you can use with that. So I first want to mention when I say magic, it has nothing to do with myths. It has nothing to do with you know, something that you see and you can't put words to it or you don't see and you think is real. You know, we talk about people on this podcast. We've talked about people in the past that uh, believe in certain religions and myths and they are led by these spiritual ideas that has nothing to do with magic. This has to do with uh, something where your brain gets tricked you know, it's, it's illusions, it's sleight of hand, it's techniques you can learn so that when someone's looking, they don't see something that was done or they, their brain is focusing on something else while something else happens. And then you bring their focus back and, oh, something's changed and they just don't have an answer for it immediately. And that's kind of what magic is. It's like, it's an art of concealing art. 
And that was a, that's a quote actually I read as well about that. So to me, it's interesting because it, it will, for especially for children, it will pull their attention towards something you do. And I want to use it in terms of stories to add something to the stories I do in class. And my original interest came from an interest in sleight of hand, you know, sleight of hand, you have something in one hand, you know, close your hand, you wave it past, and all of a sudden you open your hand, and then it's in the other hand. Things like that, where just with my hand movement, I can choreograph something where things will disappear, things will appear somewhere else. Something where I could do this uh, with objects, large and small, and something where if I saw a class needed something, some sort of thing to kind of jog their mind uh, or get them just engaged a little more deeper in what I was talking about, I could do something with sleight of hand. And YouTube is the greatest place to kind of look this stuff up and you can find a lot of people talking about that. But I also wanted to go a little bit more in depth because uh, production I am in of a ballet requires me, my character is, is literally a magician. And so I never in the past had chance to do any magic in the show, but I finally do have the chance this year. And I said, I have to make this big. It has to be in front of a lot of people and has to be kind of a large thing. And so I couldn't just do these tiny little sleight of hand things. You know, I take my pinky off and then put it back on. I have to do something very large, something that requires props and such and something that could be done in seconds because I only have seconds to do these things. So kind of got into that and that just got me into thinking, you know, I've really been interested in this for a very long time. I probably should pursue things further. And for those that are listening to this, watching this, I will mention a few books that you can, of course, get that are kind of the mainstay books that you want if you want to get into this sort of thing, uh, even if you just want to read about it, these are great books uh, to go into uh, just to get an interest in where things came from. Um, and so, yeah. Now, this definitely applies to my work as a teacher because honestly, as a musician and a music teacher, kids think that I am doing magic every single time I play music. I mean, I've had students walk by me when I'm playing in the hallways in the morning and look at what I'm doing and say, you're not really doing that. Or wait a minute. And they, I would stop playing. They go, what? I didn't even know. And they can just see my fingers and my fingers, you know, on a guitar, on a piano, whatever. They're watching it, but they don't really understand what's going on. I've had students come up and play my piano and, and, and play on just random keys. And they see what that when they're playing or many of many of them are playing, it doesn't sound so good. They, they're not, they're wondering how I am able to put these different patterns together and to make this sound. And that is kind of mag magical. That is like an illusion. And I've been doing this basically for many years in front of people. I mean, many, 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 many years. Uh, and with children, I guess I'm constantly doing this. I guess what I, I just haven't frame, always framed it as, as magic, or I haven't framed it as something that's novel and like, wow, can you see how I do this? Because to me, it's just like, well, I want to make some music and it takes a certain level to get you know, the sound that I want or that I, I think everyone expects. So I'll just do it. But I have to real, realize that it is, uh, to, to many people, it's magic that I was able to do this. So there's this uh, shock and awe value of everything. Uh, but I'm not really there for, for that. I want to be able to help others learn how I'm doing this and teach others that it's practice, it's dedication, uh, it's effort to just make things happen. And you should be doing that. You should be putting effort in. You should have things you practice daily. Uh, it's just something that you have to keep, keep at. And there's rewards for doing that. And if you can get enough of these things going at the same time, you'll have a very scheduled life, but you'll also have 
the rewards of being able to show off what you can do. And as a performer, and I probably, probably first and foremost, am a performer, I think above all else, think of myself part as a psychologist as well. I think of myself, you know, I am a teacher, I'm a musician, but for the most part, I'm a performer. It doesn't matter what it is. Someone says I have to speak in front of, a, of an audience. Great. I'm going to perform. If I have to, I have to judge a room and see, you know, what my audience is and what I think might go. Uh, it's I'm thinking like a performer and that's how I do it in class as well, because all my my lessons are pretty much choreographed and there's a storyline throughout them. Uh, past few weeks in some classes, I've, I've somewhat lost this because of the fact that we've had so few students because people have been quarantined and the fact that I didn't want to begin something very large with the class, like a unit that I have waiting in the wings because there's not enough students. So, but, you know, I'm a performer and maybe there's a little bit of shock and awe with everything I do. And I kind of wanted to thought, think that I could, pay, you know, use this uh, in a little bit more depth. And that's kind of why I've kind of pursued this magic journey, I guess you want to call it. So, so other big thing, uh, and if you're looking at the slide, I have these little kind of block notes and my next big block is the first thing says a tough year needs new life i actually listened to a music teacher podcast uh and it's it's constantly been like i know this year's tough i know people are talking about being stressed out people are being you know at the brink of quitting because it's, it seems like they're getting nowhere. They're not able to uh, make any headway into their curriculum. Activities not working. Students are just in another world, you know, with their mindset. And yeah, we're all experiencing this. It's really hard to have students get engaged. And a lot of teachers are just pulling at straws, um, myself included, because there's so many ways I can go. And yet... I've had some big successes and I have things that just did not work with certain classes because of behaviors, you know, a lot of behaviors and the general mindset that uh, classroom teachers instill in their students because they're depressed because they don't want to, you know, work hard and, and find new ways to adapt. They want to take the same thing they've been doing and just kind of stick it, push it through the minds of these students and it's just not working for them and whatever they're going to still follow it they're going to do what they say is their job whereas i'm completely adaptive and i want to make things work i'm not saying all teachers are doing that but in general and the ua teachers in probably believe this in, in a general sense is that you can see the mood of the class based upon the uh, work of the classroom teacher so especially when the teacher leaves and the students all of a sudden erupt into some sort of chaos. But when the teacher shows up, they're prim and proper. If they're, if they're erupting into chaos, that means they've wanted that chaos to happen and they're holding it back. But it should have been worked out of them, you know, but I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go into this sort of uh, <laughs> rant right now. It's just the fact that we're all struggling and we all need to make things uh, better for students and help engage. And what we're trying to engage in is the mind. Uh, so great minds are being sought. And I wrote that down, not just for teachers looking for great ideas. And I have my, you know, series of blogs and other avenues to look for new ideas, but I'm looking for great minds in my classes I'm looking for something that makes uh, brains hungry to explore. And for me, magic is going to be one of those things that kind of just, I want people to be questioning, what am I looking at? What just happened? Wait a minute. Can I question other things that happened, that happened in my life or are happening, you know, with this same sort of critical lens? I want that to happen. And everything in my class, I hope, helps students think of things that way. And even, and I think I haven't, you know, 
exactly been direct about that, but I am going to start being very direct about that's what my goal is. Because I think students don't realize that there is, my goal is not just to have them move to my next, you know, level of my standards or my, my next level of understanding on my journey with them throughout the year of musical elements. My, I just want them to, to be better thinkers. I mean, that could be just when they express themselves with their opinions, would they, they hear things that they weren't able to hear before. And as such, you know, there's a lot of things I'm looking for materials all the time that I can use for that. And a lot of things just don't work because the context they're put into is something that happened way before this year. And when things were, you know, we were able to do something without having to completely enrapture someone's mind. You know, I'm not a screen, I'm not a TikTok video, I'm not a meme. And I honestly feel I might have to start using these things just to get attention. And it's, it's, it's pretty bad that it has to get to that. But at the same time, that's, that's what you have to do. You have to adapt. So magic is also leading me to some new avenues of interest. Uh, puzzles, riddles, uh, questions that have more than one answer. Things that I can use uh, just to kind of get that, that sort of brain wave with students where they can be thinking and maybe questioning themselves a little bit. Now, I'm not, you know, I, I teach everyone from the littles up to uh, basically preteens around teenage, uh, early teenagers. And I'm not expecting a lot from the, from the, the younger students. Uh, I really want to get them, you know, always excited to be in my class and such, but for the older students, I want them to think in terms of like, as they're thinking about who they are as a person, I want them to think about what they like and what they don't like uh, in terms of things in the world and how possibly I can be, I can help them at least with something that could comfort them or for something they can hold on to, uh, to make sense over the next few years, which is going to be very difficult with their hormones and their maturing and such, and especially the social environments they get themselves into. So that's one big thing that I think uh, taking something like magic, illusions, uh, conjuring, whatever you want to call it, uh, can do is that can get us into something where you can practice something and we can sort of be fascinated with something that doesn't involve, you know, being social and having to worry about what we look like and everything like that. And this definitely can mark a turning point for a lot of people. Um, and I just want to make it an easier transition. Not like I had a decent transition at all when I was growing up, um, but I didn't have all of this stuff and I didn't have anyone helping me out. I had teachers that were basically self-centered and some of them were there for the job and some of them were there. I don't know. I don't know if they, if they, if they really wanted to put a lot of effort in. So, and that's the thing. If you can, if you're old enough and you can look back and, and not really remember anybody, Hey, that's the influence they had on you. Not much. So I want to go over before I get into my last little section of this, uh, a few books and kind of what got me a little bit further into this and, and some good reading you possibly could do. Uh, I listened to another podcast and it's one of the most, I think one of the most famous podcasts on, uh, you know, in podcast land, whatever you want to call it, uh, called the skeptics guide to the universe. It's for skeptics. It's for people that believe in science, people that believe in critical thinking. Uh, I think it's for everybody. And they've been doing this thing for 16, 17 years. I've been listening since maybe day one or you know, or the fifth week in, whatever. It's been such a long time. I remember when I first got an iPod classic. I think it was 2000. I want to say 2005. So yeah, they've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, and that was one of the first podcasts I looked for, something science-based. Well, they recently had a show and they interviewed uh, David Copperfield who is a magician, 
man who's been a magician for many, many years. Uh, he's the person that made the Statue of Liberty disappear and he could fly and all of this stuff. And he had specials on TV. And I went to see him when I was very young with my mother who you know thought he was a hunk. And I remember her getting so excited about seeing him live. And this was in Maine, of course, where I live. And I thought, wow, that was, you know, we did a couple amazing things. Of course, it took a lot of people to get all these props together. And it just it was kind of like looking around the room because it's a magic show. I was like, I don't, I don't know what to expect. Is, are things going to appear out of nowhere? Are there going to be people in the audience that are like acting? And I was thinking that when I was like, you know, I think I was 12 when I went to see him. But they interviewed him on this podcast and he said he'd released a book on the history of magic. And I thought, you know, probably a good place to start with this because interest, because I was, I've been in this production, this ballet, and I knew I had to do some magic tricks in this. I wanted to add that element. So I might just start with reading about the history. So I did. And it spurred me on to all these other books and things. And basically, David Copperfield owns a uh, magic museum, basically, in a, in a basically undisclosed location in Las Vegas, where he has a show. And he has all of these artifacts from the history of magic that were that he bought basically from someone who collected them many years before. And they come from, you know, from the mid 1800s on, um, maybe even some a little bit earlier. But he, uh, he, in this book, he describes all these different lives of different musicians, uh, magicians. And it's one of these things where I got to see how people made their, their living and how something caught on and how they traded with each other and how they stole from each other. And basically those that wanted to, uh, uh, you know, make a performance because it's, it's about performers basically. And, and, and how the performance of magic evolved kind of like, you know, a musician's performance might evolve over the years. And so that led me into actually buying a magic complete course, the one that I'm currently looking at now for the past few months uh, by uh, a person. Last name is Jay. It's called the Complete Magic Course, uh, Joshua Jay. And so I'm looking at that, and it's got a number of uh, very useful tricks. Well, we call them effects. And that is something that's practical I can use, but uh, I also would suggest for those that really want to get into this and really want a, a decent read, something that was written over 100 years ago, 120 years ago by Professor Hoffman, Modern Magic. And this is kind of like a paperback version of something that was very old, but it has some illustrations and such. And it just talks about all the tricks relevant or the effects relevant at the time and how everyone has done it. And a lot of magicians basically started after reading this and said, wow, I think I can do that. Uh, I'm also, because I've kind of changed my way with cards, I've got a course on card magic called The Royal Road to Card Magic, which I'll be looking at uh, very soon. And probably the card magic Bible to many magicians is by... S. Erdnays, the expert at the card table. And this is another thing that is, you know, over 100 years old and was written because the author needed money. <laughs> he says that right in the beginning, too. Uh, but there are many courses online you could take. There's many YouTube videos uh, getting into it. I would suggest you have some sort of index system, card index system, like I'm using, so you can kind of write down things that are interesting and put them away and you can kind of pull them up and spend time practicing on certain things. But also you should find techniques you can do daily to kind of practice with your sleight of hand and your just hand-eye coordination and do something in front of a mirror, which I do have, where you can see what the audience will see of you and see where your eyes go because where your eyes go is where the audience eyes will go. So, 
But that being said, something, you know, getting yourself into a routine might be difficult. So I would suggest doing things for like 15, 20 minutes a day and just making a, a time where you just do that. Kind of like me with working out in the morning. I just made a time where I could do that. In fact, I working out in the morning and I kind of want to set up a table that I can have so that I can actually can do some uh, card magic or something while I have the table, while I'm on like an exercise bike or something. <laughs> trying to do so many things at the same time. I try to read at the same time when I do that. I'm also listening to podcasts. Yeah, just how many things can I do at the same time? Probably not a lot, right? Your, your brain can't multitask. So, but in, in closing with this, uh, I do want everyone to ask themselves, what is magical to you? So what is something that you just, you can't really figure out or that you just find fascinating and it just, it kind of, makes those motors turn inside you know what what has that awe factor for you and if you're in front of people and you have to get their attention all the time and stuff like that maybe consider learning a few uh, magic effects or something just that can pull their attention uh, you know away from what they're doing go oh what's that or just something even random i mean i i think i may have mentioned this podcast before where a teacher had, you know, a tie and would take his tie and cut it at the beginning of the first class, people just unexpectedly go, I can't believe that person did that. And then what the person said after that, everyone remembered years, years later. uh, It's things you want to do. You can just put this in a context and just, it adds to an an effect and and it kind of helps your story, you know, have magic kind of add these, you know, peaks and valleys to your story that you're using already in your classroom or your boardroom or wherever you are in front of people. It doesn't have to be like, hey, cool, look at this. It can be like, I'm just going to do this while I'm talking and someone might will watch it and they might go, oh, how, what was that? And all of a sudden you just, another part of their brain just kind of opened up and got interested and there you go. My phone keeps ringing for some reason. Sorry. So how can this make me a better skeptic? So that's another thing I mentioned, magic. Uh, it can make you better because you're going to see the ways that people conceal, the way that people try to uh, misdirect, the way that people use uh, either their words or their motions to convey something else than what they really mean. And because a lot of magicians always turn magic into a a tricking art where they would trick people for money or they would do something that would try to better, better themselves, you know, in, in relation to another person, which I don't really, you know, like at all. I don't want to use this as tricks and that, Hey, I gotcha. See, I'm better than you, you know, or I, I was able to take this from you and you didn't know it. I, I think it should be a, a learning thing that, oh, this is how your brain thinks, or maybe you weren't paying attention. Maybe you need to pay attention. That's how I want to take that. And you can learn how to be better at hearing people talk and yet look what their body language says and see if they kind of work together, you know? Kind of get the same thing from the book I read, the uh, uh, CIA or FBI manual I read about uh, reading people's body language too. So that's one of those big things that is is very similar to what those do that do magic are trying to uh, uh, do to others because not everyone's doing this, right? People have regular jobs, regular lives, whatever regular means, and they just don't, they're not always tuned to everything that's going on or what people can pull on them. So this could make you very, very good at spotting a uh, charlatan, basically. And how can this make you a better teacher? I think in every single way, you know, if you want to be the person that is uh, pulling the wool over students' eyes, or you want to get their attention, or you just want to enhance something you're doing, this is a great way to kind of add a little bit of uh, mystery and and mystique 
to what you do. And for me, man, I mean, I'm in playing music, music, if I'm, if I'm playing any instrument in front of students to some degree, that's, that's way beyond what they've ever done, or they've never tried the instrument, then I'm already doing sort of like magic, but it doesn't relate to what they can do in a day of life. If I'm using a spoon and I'm bending a spoon, something they use almost every single day, if not every day, that's going to be more, wow, that's really personal compared to how fast my fingers can play on the piano, because if they don't see a piano every single day, that doesn't really relate to them. So magic kind of brings me closer to them by using something they see every single day. Now, I want them to see instruments every single day. I want them to know more about instruments so that when I do play something on an instrument, they can appreciate what I was doing because they know the work I had to put in to get to that level. Right now, I'm not respected because no one cares about any work I put in because they don't understand that it takes work to do this. They think I was just born this way, honestly. So I think this is going to be a way for me to kind of get uh, those more interested in what I'm doing. Uh, the biggest thing now is to kind of choreograph it and to add a storyline to some of these effects that I've got and to keep building the effects up and to keep getting better at it. So look in front of a mirror or a camera. Good thing I'm talking about one right now. Well, anyways, thank you everybody for listening to this episode, for joining me on this little journey I take. It's kind of like a diary of some sorts, but uh, yeah, it's something I can look back on. And hopefully for those that might be new to this podcast, look back and, and see the journey I've been on, the journey I'm on when I'm with uh, Mr. Richie, the other educator in the show we are the educators which is also on this channel now this is show number 78 it is the american thanksgiving day i'll be seeing a little bit of family later on uh but i'm not a big uh holiday celebration person uh, i i'm getting as many things as i can done cleaning up organizing and i still have a few days off before i go back to school but i I'm still thinking about everything I can do to improve my situation there to make it easier for students to get something out of anything that I do, you know? And I wanna talk as less as I can, but I also have a lot of students that just need me to do something, to talk, to lead them. And it's, it's getting very tough. Uh, it's some, some teachers that I've talked to personally are really contemplating you know what they're doing if it's worth it because they don't feel that they're making a difference at all and they're just everything is, is going up in flames in front of them every idea they have every activity uh for those that might be listening and you're in that same boat stick with it if you need help there are probably many people out there with blogs professional blogs there's probably podcasts these YouTube videos, you just type in whatever you want on YouTube and you probably, with a little bit of scrolling, find someone who's saying something that, that seems right to you. And then you just have to kind of go with something and try it out. I have to dive on in. Our next uh, go is three weeks until we have the big holiday season where we have a week and a half off. And by the time next year rolls up, I'm gonna act like next year, basically the new year, is gonna be like the beginning of a school year again. And I'm gonna treat it just like that. So first trimester, <laughs> crawl through, try to get through. And second trimester, brand new, everything different. So anyways, everybody out there, take care of yourselves. Uh, if you're celebrating, celebrate responsibly and look up some things on magic. Maybe it might be the one thing that uh, helps you go the extra mile for your students or your audience.